Paul Nachman. Please give him a big round of applause. Thank, thanks, Cynthia. Uh, I've got uh, the usual large amount of information. You know, you'll be drinking from a fire hose, so I'm just going to launch into it. Um, and yeah, you're going to make it into the uh, yeah. That, that's right. Okay, so. Um, um, Montana's for Immigration Law Enforcement. We have a website. It's uh, a lot of information there, but static. So uh, you might find it worthwhile to visit once or twice. And I do write at vdare.com. I'm one of the semi-frequent writers there. Next, please. Oh, uh, a couple other remarks at the start. Um, that these slides uh, will be available uh, online in a few days in a PDF form. So if I go through it too quickly for you, or you want, you know, anyway, want another look, I'll have a chance. Um, and most of them have, when I have some information there, I've also put up the URL. And I should add that on this particular aspect of immigration, uh, uh, people on our side, like me, are all students of uh, Don Barnett and Ann Corcoran. And you'll hear their names a little bit uh, later, but I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, I'm, you know, I know a lot about immigration, but this is a specialty subject, and th those are the two primo experts. So, uh, okay, refugee resettlement is a, a, a big topic. Uh, and now, now next, thanks. Okay. <laughs> but it's really a small part of a vast subject. Uh, next, please. So there's refugee resettlement, but then I populate that with next a whole bunch of other aspects of uh, mass immigration, you know, assimilation, environmental impacts. That's what got me involved in originally. I think Jim Ludwig as well. Um, illegal immigration. Well, that's what the OFER primarily is concerned about, because what can you do at the state level but combat illegal immigration if you can? And then these other impacts, and the most important probably is the et cetera, because the immigration, mass immigration, is affecting, I think, perversely, most aspects of our national life. So, next, please. So, instead, I, I put these asterisks up there. Uh, I, I call immigration not an issue. It's way bigger than an issue, uh, because it affects really all aspects of our national life. Or you could say it the way Ann Coulter, columnist Ann Coulter does, that uh, immigration is the issue that determines every other issue. Uh, so, I start here now with a, a rhetorical question because I'm going to answer it. So, what is the purpose of the United States? Next. Well, it's stated in the Constitution's preamble. Next, please. Uh, which you remember, I hope. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Next, please. So this is now emphasizing the part that I think is key for purpose. Secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Next, please. So the purpose is of the United States is to benefit the citizens of the United States. Next, please. Not to rescue the rest of humanity from its woes. Uh, next one. So, okay, another now uh, rhetorical question because I'm going to answer it too. We're in a hurry. Uh, everyone know, everyone recognizes the icon, and the answer to the question: What's its actual title? Next, please. The actual title: It's not the Statue of Liberty. It is Liberty Enlightening the World. Next, please. And it has nothing to do with immigration. It's the symbol has been captured by by the open borders forces, and, and just generally now you just associate it with immigration. It has nothing to do with immigration. Uh, next, please. And then there's the famous poem, Emma Lazarus' sonnet, uh, next, with the uh, famous words, you know, you're, you're tired, you're poor, you're huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. They don't give so much attention to the part about the wretched, wretched refuse, but that's, it, but that's in there too. Anyway, next please. So that was not part of the statue, it's added to the pedestal, um, and it was added ten years after the statue was, uh, was, was put up. So it was added with nobody's permission. Uh, Congress didn't weigh in on this, but it was just attached to the statue's pedestal. And certainly no uh, input from the um, ordinary Americans who are going to have to make, make room for the huddled masses. Next, please. Um, if that's a, a new point to you, if, if you didn't know that basic fact about the statue, I could not re recommend an article more highly than I recommend this article. It was in, of all places, the Washington Post, July 5th, 2009. She was never about those huddled masses. It's a great article, but right at the start, in fact, uh, next please, the author puts his thesis or his recommendation, let's get rid of the poem. Uh, next please. And um, the author, who's the author? It's Roberto Ciro. He is a uh, professor of communications, the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Southern California. And 
He was founding director of, guess what, next please, the Pew Hispanic Center. So this is, you know, a rabid right winger. Uh, writing a writing an article, let's get rid of the uh, poem, she was never about the huddled masses. Next, please. So here is a, a summary statement by James Fulford, who was editor at VDARE. I think I'll let you uh, just read that for yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, did, was there enough time to go? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. Every yeah. time you lift your arm. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Uh, okay, now next. No. And, 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 and here is just a, a quick example of well, this is a, uh, I just found this online a few months ago, and there are probably thousands of things like this. Na Neighbors United, the Refugee Collaborative of Boise, Idaho, and they just incorporate the uh, usual iconography about the, about the uh, statue. Uh, and so I just wanted to show that to you as an example. Next, please. So now we have some technical talk, definition of refugee. Next, please. Um, then now there were refugees, especially after World War II, um, you know, displaced people in, in Europe. Um, and there's a, a member of the audience who probably can tell us about that um, from personal experience. But anyway, so there were refugees in the U.S. before the 1980 Refugee Act, and there were also rounds of refugees from Cuba and in the wake of the Vietnam War. But in any event, in 1980, the Refugee Act was passed. And this is my uh, paraphrase of what's in it. A refugee is a, uh, is a per I'm sorry, <laughs> a refugee is a person who is outside his country of citizenship and is unwilling to return there because of persecution or a well-founded fear of persecution due to race, the obvious categories, race, religion, nationality, or political opinion, or, next one please, membership in a particular social group. So um, I'm highlighting that here because I'm going to come back to that for some examples in a, in a few slides. Um, the, your resource on that, by the way, is uh, uh, Cornell University Law School. They have uh, all of the U.S. code uh, on, online there. Okay, what about refugees in the U.S.? We admit more than two-thirds of the refugees resettled permanently anywhere in the entire industrialized world. In other words, we take uh, more... That, that, that's, a, that's a clear enough statement. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, next, please. Okay, but you say, well, what about the million people who are coming to Europe in the last year or two, or maybe several million? What about them? Uh, the answer is, next, it's mostly, those are economic opportunists. Those are not actual refugees. They're just taking advantage of the, of the chaos. And then the next question is, well, what about these huge refugee camps in the Middle East? Um, they're in uh, Lebanon, in um, Turkey, Jordan, and I think there might even be some camps in Syria. I'm, I'm not sure about that. It's a big subject, can't know everything. Well, the answer to that next, please, Jerry. Well, those aren't permanent. Those are refugee camps. Those are not expected to be places where they spend the rest of their lives. Next, please. Uh, other definitions that are uh, basic to the whole subject. Um, what is an alien? Well, an alien is any non-U.S. citizen. There may be some aliens in the room here who are people who are immigrated here or just visiting here uh, legally. Um, any non-U.S. citizen is an alien. It doesn't have anything to do with space aliens. It's, it's, it's not a pejorative term. Um, well, among aliens, there are legal, permanent, oh, that should be lawful, permanent resident, LPR, and that's the same thing as someone who has a green card, uh, and that includes refugees, and I've got refugees a second time here in quotes for a particular reason, which we'll get to shortly. Uh, or you could be a visitor, you could be a tourist, or a foreign student, or a, a guest worker, and guest workers, I've got that in quotes too, because often they don't go home, even though they're supposed to. And then there's the category of illegal alien, which is you know, familiar to Hofer people. Um, and that could be a border violator, which is a criminal offense. See Title VIII, uh, Section 1325 of the US, 1325A of the U.S. Code. Or you could be a visa overstayer. You came here legally and then didn't go back when you were supposed to. And that's not a criminal offense. I'm not sure why, whether that's an oversight or if that's intentional, but it's not a criminal offense. But still, people who are here illegally, as illegal aliens, because they overstayed a visa, they are deportable. Next, please. And then there's the category of asylee. Asylee is an alien who gains refugee status while already in the U.S. Could be a person who came here illegally and applied for asylum, or it could be a person who was visiting legally and then applied for asylum. Next. So in 2003, uh, I'd already been well involved in this subject, and I met Jan Ting at a conference in Southern California that was about um, immigration and assimilation and so forth. 
Um, and he's a law professor at Temple University in Philadelphia. He is he's not an immigrant himself. His parents came here from China after World War II. He was born in Michigan, a uh, graduate of Oberlin. And um, he was also, next please, Jerry. He, I learned immediately upon being introduced to him that he had been assistant commissioner of the old Immigration and Naturalization Service under the first President Bush around, around 1990. Uh, and so uh, upon meeting him, I immediately asked him, is it true what I've heard that 90% of refugee and asylum cases are fraudulent? And instantly he answered, 95%. <laughs> so uh, next, please. This is Ann Coulter's book that, that was just lent out, a copy just lent out for uh, until the next meeting. I highly recommend the book. I've been involved in the subject for you know a couple decades almost, and I learned a lot by reading the book. Uh, and she's also a terrific phrase maker. And one of the uh, notable phrases or concepts I uh, came across was the quote here about refugee and asylum cases. I'll let you read that to yourselves. And well, you know, she's a, a given to a bit, a bit of overstatement, but it's really just a bit in this case, you know, put that together with Jan Ting and with all the other uh, things I've read about uh, refugee and asylum cases, including next, the next example, for example. This I, I saw in the LA Times, I was living in Redondo Beach, California in 1998. It was just an article in the Times, and you can, you can still find it online. Um, example of asylum fraud. So you have a, a, a Kurd who lived in Iraq, and he was in the Iraqi army, and apparently he's, this is a, a case of a genuine uh, qualifier for refugee status somewhere, being tortured in the, in the army. So he escaped Iraq and went to Iran, and at some point, the article doesn't say when, he stowed away on a, a ship for Brazil, and he wound up in Brazil. And it doesn't say how long he stayed in Brazil, but then he stowed away on another ship for the U.S. And when he arrived in the U.S., then he applied for asylum. Well, you know, why didn't he apply for asylum in Iran or maybe more sensibly in Brazil? No, he waited till he got here to the land of milk and honey. And he was granted, uh, get granted asylum. So I consider that fraudulent because uh, he wasn't in any danger, once, at least once he got into Brazil. But he, he came on to the U.S.